I can't think of a better way to open a symposium on emerging infectious diseases and the importance of studying them and communicating them than to uh, have two internationally recognized leaders in science and science writing and have them share their experiences and passion for their work with you, Anthony Fauci and David Quammen. Anthony Fauci is the director of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases and continues to head the Laboratory of Immunoregulation at the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Fauci is not only an outstanding scientist who has made major contributions to the study of HIV and AIDS and in the drive to develop an effective vaccine, but an outspoken advocate for the support for fundamental basic research, translating this knowledge from that research into public health solutions and supporting the training of our future leaders in biomedical sciences. At NIAID, he oversees an extensive research portfolio devoted to preventing, diagnosing, and treating infectious and immune-mediated diseases while serving as a key advisor to the White House, the Department of Health and Human Services, and the Congress, which I'm sure is uh, a joy, always, uh, on a variety of critical issues, uh, ranging from AIDS to Zika, and on initiatives to bolster medical and public health preparedness against emerging infectious disease threats. Dr. Fauci is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and a recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the National Medal of Science, the Robert Koch Medal, the Mary Woodard Lasker Award for Public Service, and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. We're truly delighted to have Dr. Fauci join us. His talk is entitled, From AIDS to Zika, The Enduring Challenge of Emerging Infectious Diseases. Tony. Thank you very much, Ron. It's really a great pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to kick off this inaugural symposium. And as you heard, since the symposium is A to Z, I thought I would entitle my talk from AIDS to Zika, The Enduring Challenges. I've been asked um, to set the stage for an overview of emerging infectious diseases, and that's exactly what I'd like to do uh, to kick off the discussion for today and throughout the symposium. I think many of us in the audience realize the extraordinary historical impact of emerging infectious diseases in that at the time, historically, when there were little countermeasures against emerging infectious disease, what we're calling plagues and outbreaks actually greatly fashioned civilization and societies. And this is very well described in so many publications, including those shown on this slide when very vivid and detailed descriptions were given as to the impact of a variety of outbreaks on how the world and its civilizations were fashioned. These are just some examples of notable epidemics and outbreaks. I can't go through all of these because of time constraints, but if you take the first one, the famous Black Plague, which really had such a profound influence on Europe and the rest of the world that it actually had an influence on the evolution of nations and regions of the world down to the 1918 pandemic influenza, which as we all know now, killed more troops in World War I than actual battle itself, which is really tells you something about the profound influence. However, despite this historically, there's been extraordinary progress in the control of infectious diseases. Things that we're very familiar with and take for granted now, such as the germ theory, recognizing that microbes cause diseases, improvements in sanitation, hygiene, vector control, our ability to monitor and survey disease, the development of antimicrobials, and of course, the very important development of vaccines. And so what has happened, and a good example is here in the United States, is that over the years where the infectious diseases deaths were predominant, they have decreased dramatically over the years as shown on this slide. This is a slide that I was showing to the, Congress, to the Congress, I testify several times a year for the budget of the NIH, and I'll get back to that in a moment, to the Congress, and I was trying to bring up the point of the diminution and decrease of infectious diseases. But I got so used to that blip on the left-hand side of the slide that I didn't pay attention to it until the congressman said, what the hell is that? 
And I said, that was the influenza pandemic of 19. So everybody got agitated about influenza. So that slide made us about an additional $30 million just by showing that slide. <laughs> so the attitude was one of beyond complacency. It was almost hubris. Many scholars, and this is just one, Iden Cockburn, in a treatise he wrote on the evolution and eradication of infectious diseases. We can look forward with confidence to considerable degree of freedom from IDs at a time not too far in the future. This was 1963, not too long ago. It seems reasonable to anticipate that within some measurable time, all the major infectious will have disappeared. Now, that's a very interesting thing for a scholar to say because it tells a couple of things. One, a lack of appreciation of what microbes are, but in, it also, importantly, it bespoke a failure to look beyond our borders because at the time he was writing this, there were a million people a year dying of malaria, a million and a half dying of tuberculosis, and he was talking about infectious diseases are no longer a problem. But they are a problem, as shown by this recent pie chart that came out in Lancet. Infectious diseases account for about 16% of the 55 million deaths that occur in the world each year. If you look at the regions of the world, it is the leading cause of death in developing nations, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, from birth to 45 years old. The leading cause of DALIs, disability adjusted life years, which as you know, is a combination of disabilities and death. So it is really very important. So let's be a given that that's important. And now how are we gonna integrate the deaths from infectious diseases from the threat of diseases that we don't even know about? So I do that in my own mind by breaking up global health and infectious diseases into three categories, actually two categories, one of which has a subcategory. The first is established infectious disease which to me means that you can reliably predict within a small era from year to year what the morbidity and mortality of certain diseases are. And there's some good examples of that. For example, we know now that next year, somewhere around 2.6 million people will die of lower respiratory diseases, 1.5 million will die of tuberculosis, hepatitis will claim about 1.4 and on and on. Notice that HIV AIDS is there as an established disease. When I gave this talk 35 years ago, AIDS was in the other slide that I'm gonna show you in a moment, namely a brand new emerging disease. So if you go through newly emerging diseases and re-emerging diseases, it's a very interesting, fascinating story. So 35 years, excuse me, 32 years ago, was the first time I testified before Congress in my first year as director of the NIAID. That was 14 years old at the time. Um, I showed a map of the world because I wanted to point out how an emerging disease can occur in a certain region of the world and spread. So the first one I put on the slide was HIV. This was 1984. It had already been around for now three years in 1984. I show this same map at least two or three times a year to the Appropriations Committee of Congress, and they never get bored with it because each year I add one or two or three new emerging infectious diseases. This is the last slide that I had showed to them last March when I testified for our budget. And this is what happens when you put them all together. All of diseases, some of which are blips on the radar screen, but some of them are rather profound. If you focus in, because that's a very difficult slide, I particularly make that slide completely impossible to read because I want to overwhelm them so they would give me more money. <laughs> but for the last several years, they haven't, but that's another story. So in 2015 and 16, there are things like measles outbreak in California, drug-resistant TB, but look at the lower right-hand side of the slide with dengue, chikungunya, and Zika, things that we're dealing with right now in the Americas. Now, factors that contribute to convert to reemergence of disease are things we're all familiar with. It mostly relates to what we humans do. Demographics and behavior, the technology and industry, economic development, importantly, international travel, breaking down of public health measures, 
like earthquakes in Haiti that lead to outbreaks of cholera. Microbial adaptation and change, resistant malaria, resistant TB, MRSA, CRE. We'll get to those in a second. Also important to point out that's not fully appreciated is about 75% of emerging pathogens are zoonotic. They're essentially animal microbes, mostly viruses, that jump species. These are just a few of those that are primarily zoonotic and then jump to human. So let's get back now to newly emerging diseases. As I mentioned, in our generation, the mother of all emerging infectious diseases is HIV. Because if you look historically at that second slide I showed you, and you put HIV on that slide, it would be in the top three or four among killers. There have been 80 million infections. There are 36 million people who've died, about 37 million who are living with HIV, 1.2 million deaths per year, and 2 million new infections. What happened with HIV? This is a slide that I have to mention that actually completely changed my professional career and my life. And these were the two MMWRs that came from the CDC reporting at first five men from Los Angeles with pneumocystis pneumonia. I didn't take, think much of that. I wasn't quite sure what it meant. I thought that maybe there was some drug that they had taken that suppressed their immune system. Then one month later, on July 3rd, 26, again, curiously, all gay men, not only from LA, but from San Francisco and New York, who presented not only with pneumocystis, but with Kaposi sarcoma and other opportunistic infections. And it was at that point that I completely changed what I was doing and started intensively studying that disease, which I've been doing for the past 35 years. It is very interesting. I'm looking now at, at my colleague, uh, Larry Altman, who wrote essentially the first article about this, bringing attention to this uh, back in the days when the, ca the, ca the cases started to accumulate. I wrote an editorial, what I thought was an editorial, for the Washington, for, for, the, uh, for the New England Journal of Medicine. And the reason I wrote it is because my mentors were saying, why the hell are you abandoning a very productive career in immunology and infectious disease to study these 100 and whatever it was when Larry wrote the article, 41 was, I think, the article, the original one, number of individuals with this strange disease. So I had to do what I call an apologia pro vita sua. I took Jesuit training. That means an apology for your life. <laughs> and the apology for my life was, because we don't know the cause of this syndrome, any assumption that it's going to remain restricted to a particular segment of society is truly an assumption without scientific basis. And unfortunately, that happened to be very prescient because what happened soon thereafter, it became clear that it was really a global disease. And now you fast forward 35 years, and these are the numbers that I just mentioned to you. However, the science that was put into the study of this brand new disease, the kinds of things we're talking about today when we visit the needle and other places, has been nothing short of breathtaking. And in fact, one of these is still historic when you look about the relationship between investment in science and transforming a disease. Because, again, I show this. This is a picture of me on rounds in my ward in 1981, in December of 1981, with one of the earliest AIDS patients. I show this for two reasons, to remind me what it was like then and to let people know there was a time when I actually did have black hair. Um, the median survival at that point was about 8 to 15 months. Right now, if you look at the number of drugs that have been developed, at least 30, which when used in combination, in the same building that I still see HIV-infected individuals, right now, if you take a 20-year-old individual and put them on triple combination of drug, you can look them in the eye and honestly say you will live an additional 50, five zero years, all other things being equal which has to go down as one of the most important accomplishments in biomedical research and its translation of any disease. This one happens to be an emerging infectious disease. Prevention is also critical. In fact, we now have a whole host of, of prevention modalities which, when used in combination, can actually turn around the rate of infection if, in fact, 
they are adhered to, and we don't have time to go into each and every one of them. I wrote this article for the Washington Post in January, and it's interesting, the reason I wrote it is because I have been very passionate that if we actually implement the, res the, the scientific advances that we have, we can turn around the epidemic. We use the word ended. What it really means is turn around the trajectory so that it starts going down. And once you do that with an infectious disease, it has its own momentum of decreasing the same way as an epidemic has its own momentum of going up. And I really think that we can do this and we can do this effectively. So let's move on about other new diseases. And when we say new, we mean newly recognized. Ebola at one time was a brand new disease. It was recognized in 1976 in Zaire in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and then in Sudan at about the same time. That was a new disease. We'll get back to that now because it has the dual distinction of being a new disease and now a re-emerging disease in what we've just seen. What about SARS, the severe, acquired, the severe acute respiratory syndrome? Again, a brand new disease that began in China, was first recognized when a person went to Hong Kong, was in a certain hotel in Hong Kong, infected about 19 people. They left, and then all of a sudden it became a worldwide break outbreak. Lucky for us, it stopped almost spontaneously. It isn't spontaneously, it was good public health measures at 8,000 individuals with close to 800 deaths. Now let's get to re-emerging infections. Re-emerging infections are really quite problematic because they're not brand new, but they reappear either in a different location, in a different form, in a different way. And these are the ones that we've actually really been experiencing very much over the last several years. West Nile virus. Amazing. West Nile virus has been around forever in Africa and the Middle East. In 1999, either a mosquito, a bird, and or a person got on a plane in Israel and landed at Kennedy Airport. And now all of a sudden, West Nile is essentially endemic to varying degrees, sometimes just a few infections, sometimes a lot of infections. Multiple and extensively drug-resistant tuberculosis a very serious problem that merged and interdigitated with another emerging disease. The dual epidemic of HIV and TB has brought TB back on everybody's radar screen. One third of all the deaths of HIV infected individuals globally is from TB, many of them with resistant TB. Antimicrobial resistant threats, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae, in my own hospital at the NIH, we had a significant outbreak of CRE that some of you may have read about in the newspaper. We tracked it down, and 18 individuals ultimately got infected. Dengue in the Americas. Dengue over the last couple of decades has come to the Americas as one of several arboviruses, including West Nile and chikungunya, and now dengue is endemic and a very serious problem in South America and in the Caribbean. If the Americas didn't have enough, in 2013, along came chikungunya, again, for the first time being recognized in the Caribbean and essentially, for at least a couple of years, wrecked the economy of the Caribbean because people didn't particularly feel like traveling to the Caribbean because chikungunya, although not really fatal for the most part, is a rather debilitating disease. And then there was Ebola. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ebola because Ebola has that distinction of being both a new disease a few decades ago and a re-emerging disease now. So every other Ebola outbreak, and, and this is, I, I, I would say the beauty, but the beauty sounds like I, I really like it. I don't like it, but there's something about this that is really fascinating. From the 1976 outbreak to the 2014 outbreak, there were 24 separate outbreaks of Ebola, ranging from two cases to a couple of hundred cases. But because of the location and the density of population where it occurred, usually in villages that were not connected to anything, it never turned into something explosive. Then the perfect storm of infectious disease occurred. 
Ebola landed in a region of the world, West Africa, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, that had never had Ebola before, had a terrible healthcare system, and was just recovering from significant political disarray that had them have a complete distrust in authority. And what happened? In a couple of years, there were 28,000 cases with 11,000 deaths. Many, many, many fold more than all of the Ebola outbreaks put together occurred in one spot. And that's when also we had a very interesting situation of something that's scary over there that gets people really afraid over here. And I think most of the people in the audience can remember the tension that occurred when one patient came from Liberia to Texas, got infected in Liberia, was missed in the diagnosis, which happens in Dallas, presented to the emergency room, was sent home, came back, and for the first couple of days was taken care of by a team of critical care specialists, including two nurses, Nina Pham and Emma Vincent. Both of them got infected. And when they got infected, there was panic in this country because everybody was calling up saying, should I get on a plane? Not really understanding how it was transmitted. I had the opportunity of being able to take care of a couple of patients. One of them was Nina Pham because Texas was so overwhelmed with a fear that there was going to be explosion that as soon as Nina and Amber got um, infected, they sent Nina to us and they sent Amber to Emory to be taken care of. The NIH, and this is important because this has to do with some of the things that I was, we were talking about today when we toured the needle. The NIH is one of three places in the country that have now been designated as high capability. We now have several others, not just three, but Nebraska, Emory, and the NIH. And the picture there is a picture of the NIH Clinical Center, and right in the big building there, Years ago, we built a special clinical studies unit. And we built it because we were, the reason for building it is that we wanted a facility in case someone accidentally got infected with a, with a level three, level four microbe that we had to take care of. It wasn't that we started training when Ebola came around. We were training for something that would be an accident among the military or what, what have you. So as soon as, Nina came along, we took care of her. And this is a picture that got a lot of press. Uh, it was a, made the front page of the Washington Post of me publicly discharging Nina at a time when uh, there was a lot of concern about Ebola patients being stigmatized. So I made it very clear when I threw my arm around her in front of everybody and we walked off the stage together. And that on, on the right is probably even more important is our nursing staff who was absolutely extraordinary. But something else happened that never made the press because this individual wanted to be anonymous. And it was a patient who worked with Partners in Health with Paul Farmer in Sierra Leone who got infected and was brought to us. Um, it was very interesting. The patient was flown into Dulles Airport and then had a an ambulance with people dressed like this. So this is my team greeting them at the back door of the NIH. Uh, I show you this because this is exactly what we were walking around talking about today. Um, this is my team taking the patient um, from the hallway into the elevator, which leads right up to the Special Clinical Studies Unit. And we had been training for this for a very long time. So we had teams, and the team was one infectious disease specialist, one critical care person, two clinical specialist nurse, a respiratory physiologist, and a whole corps of nurses. And we would rotate every couple of days being on 24 hours. So this is an example. This is me in the nurse's station getting ready to go in our shift. And the person with me is Dan Chertow, who had spent months in West Africa getting extensive experience. And here's me suiting up, getting ready to go in on my shift. We weren't allowed to be in the room any more than two hours because it just gets so exhausting with that material. And here we are taking care of one of the most deathly ill patients that I've ever taken care of. That's me on the left and Dan Chertow on the right. 
That was the, the, the very stressful news. The great news is that the patient walked out of the hospital after a few weeks wearing an NIH sweatshirt that I had bought him. Now, what am I doing with myself lately? Zika, again, trailing the infectious disease and the emerging infectious diseases issue. This is going to be in the textbook of, of, of epidemiology in the future. It's absolutely such a classic issue. First recognized in 1947 in the Zika forest of Uganda, hence the word Zika virus. No human infections recognized till 1952 in Nigeria. Then it went under the radar screen. And when I say went under the radar screen, I'm not really sure what that means. There may have been outbreaks in Africa and Southeast Asia that nobody recognized because of everything else that's going on there. Malaria, a variety of other diseases that could have gotten confused, and there could have been the complications. So under the radar screen until 2007, when there was a small outbreak in the Yap Islands, mm, we looked at it, I looked at it, I said, I'm getting a little nervous about this, but it didn't exactly, you know, this was even before Ebola. 2013, French Polynesia, and then another perfect storm. There's a certain something about perfect storms and outbreaks. I told you about the perfect storm with Ebola in West Africa. The perfect storm was when it reached Brazil, it reached the country with a lot of people, a lot of mosquitoes, pockets of poverty that would lead to the mosquito density, a completely immunologically naive population they've never ever experienced, but importantly, Brazil is a country with an excellent healthcare system and really smart epidemiologists. So rather than just being under the radar screen, they started to notice something that nobody else noticed about Zika. One, for everybody else except a pregnant woman, it's a relatively minor disease. In fact, it's inconsequential. 80% of people have no symptoms, 20% have mild symptoms. Aches, pains, fever, rash, conjunctivitis. Then we started, it was an amazing thing as things unfold. We didn't know much about it, but then every week we found out something new. First we found out that there were mosquitoes that transmitted, we know that. Then we found out that it was intrauterine and perinatal transmission. Then we found that there was sexual transmission, like what is going on here? Then we found out it could be transmitted through blood transfusion as well as other interesting things. The first and important thing which transforms this and really defines it is the amazing spike in microcephaly. There was a lot of discussion as to whether it really is related to microcephaly. For those of you keeping up with the literature, Lancet, had a paper out recently that made it absolutely clear that there's a 50 times chance greater of someone who's infected with Zika of getting microcephaly than it is a baby who's born in the general population without Zika. And this is the unfortunate situation of what babies look like. Guillain-Barre syndrome, an absolute relationship. If you look at the spikes in Zika in the green, superimposed are the spikes with Guillain-Barre in the yellow, they occurred at exactly the same time. The incidence is about one in every five to 6,000 infections. If you look at the vulnerability, and this is where the United States is a little bit worried, but unlike Ebola, we should be worried a little bit, at least if you live in a certain part of the country. These are the areas where you have environmentally suitable for Zika transmission. What do you mean by environmentally suitable? Warm weather year round and a lot of mosquitoes. In that group of dark orange, 300 million people live and 5.4 million births each year. It was very interesting. When, we, when Tom Frieden and I first began the first of our, I don't know, dozens of appearances before the Congress about this, one of the congressmen asked, he says, well, you know, if, if um, if the people are coming into the country who have infected, why don't we just not let anybody into the country who's infected? And then we pointed out to them that 216 million people <laughs> come from the United States to an infected region, so it would be kind of tough to close the borders, and we have a lot of travel-related cases. But that's the critical issue. There are over 3,000 travel-related cases in the United States that are recognized 
continental United States, the 17,000 of the territories, that's Puerto Rico. Since 80% of the people don't have any symptoms, that 3,000 number is likely 10,000 travel-related cases. So when you have travel-related cases, and a lot of mosquitoes, particularly in the southeast and Gulf Coast states, what you're going to have is local transmission. Now, among these travel-related cases, there's a lot of pregnancies. So in the United States, get ready for it. We're going to start to see a fair number of microcephalic babies as these pregnancies come to fruition. We already have 18 live-born infants with birth defects already that have occurred in this country. We don't know how many we're going to see, they say anywhere from 1% to 13% of their pregnancies. Puerto Rico, we should really be worried about Puerto Rico. This is a map of the just, you know, essentially dark means infection, light means no infection. In January, this is what the Zika map looked like in Puerto Rico. In September, right now, Puerto Rico is having 1% of their population is getting infected every week. 4% are getting infected every month. That's a lot. When the chikungunya outbreak came, 25% of the whole population got infected. For that reason, HHS has declared a public health emergency as they should have. But take a look at Florida. Florida each day gets more and more cases. If you look at the number of locally transmitted cases in Florida, particularly southern Florida, it's 79. There were four more before this slide was made, which made 83 plus 10. Florida doesn't count it as a Florida state, interestingly. If you get infected in Florida, but you go home to Ohio, they don't count it as a Florida case. Um, so add 10 to that. What are we doing about it? This is another example of how you can respond to emerging infectious diseases. We had been developing different platforms, we being the field, not just NIH. A bunch of people have been doing that. And one of them is a DNA vaccine, which first went into trial on August the 2nd. We did it, and then Inovio did the same thing. We now have about 38 people. It's going to be a total of 80. And in January to February of 2017, we'll go into a phase two trial. So I'm going to stay on time, so I'm going to end with this last slide that David Morins and Greg Focus and I wrote eight years ago, and that is emerging infectious diseases, we entitled it a perpetual challenge for the simple reason is that what we're doing now and what we're experiencing now is really nothing new. There have always been emerging infectious diseases, as I've told you historically. We are in the middle of multiple emerging infectious diseases outbreaks now, and there will always be emerging infectious diseases, which is the reason why we need people and efforts that are going on right here at BU. Thank you.